Well, hello there and happy holidays. I am Mark Risen Hopkins, uh, and we're doing our year end predictions and reflections and trend spotting and all that stuff. And today I am joined by John McRae, who you may have known from his stint at Comcast and Tuner Fish, uh, working on uh, mostly video and social, right, John? Uh, yes, right at the intersection of uh, social and TV. Right. And uh, so we, we've talked many times, and you, uh, we, when you were yeah. still doing them with, uh, with uh, the other social activity streams folks, we were running your, your, uh, your, your videos that you were doing with uh, Chris and Joseph Smar and everybody yep. in that. Social Web TV back yes. in the day. That's right. So you've got a, a pretty, I mean, a pretty interesting, I think, Every time we've talked, pretty interesting perspective on the future of tech, and and I mean, because those are those are folks that that you hang out with that are always working on the future of tech. Not to mention you yourself doing some pretty innovative things. So I'm always curious to hear your perspective on what we're going to see in the coming year. So uh, and you you've recently put out your blog, uh, your your yearly uh, predictions post. So why don't we uh, talk a little bit about what you think is coming up? Sure. I think the first of all, it's uh, really looking at the consumer side of things, not at the enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really exciting time in the consumer tech space. Um, I've been in Silicon Valley for a few decades and I've gotten to see big waves and uh, big troughs. And uh, right now, the, my biggest prediction for 2012 and beyond is that we're, we're actually seeing something I've never seen before, which is not one or two big waves, but actually four distinct waves happening at the same time mm -hmm. and amplifying each other's effects when they all come together. And those four individual waves are, uh, three of them are really about computing and where and how it happens. Uh, and so those are, um, uh, not surprisingly, mobile, um, and cloud, which a lot of people are talking about, but also this emerging wave of connected devices. Right. And, and the fourth of the waves is uh, social, which is certainly the topic that's been central on my blog and back in the day with Social Web TV. But right. I think these four waves come together in a transformative way that enables essentially radically better consumer services radically better as a result of those consumer services being able to know way more about you than has ever been possible before. And I think of that really constituting a mega trend, uh, which for want of a better term I'm calling pervasive personal clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, where pervasive is uh, sort of multiple meanings. It's available to you everywhere at any time. Uh, and it's uh, also arising out of uh, a pervasive kind of computing that's less about what's happening on your desktop and more about what's happening in your pocket, uh, on your head, or, uh, or in some uh, enormous data centers that you have no idea where they're located. Right. Well, I mean, I, so we at Silicon Angle, I mean, the reason why we got into enterprise is, well, first of all, a lot of us had like some you know, latent, untrumpeted background in enterprise, so we could speak intelligently about it. But we found that after having covered uh, social and, and like kind of the consumer tech for so long, that we found it was a really good predictor of what was going on in the enterprise world. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 been like to the to the letter. You could almost, I mean, EMC's biggest uh, you know marketing shift in the last two years was uh, they. We're talking about you know, journey of the private cloud when no one else was really talking about cloud in the enterprise space, and now their their motto is uh, big. Let's see, was it the the intersection of uh, big data and uh, private cloud or something like that? Basically, they, they're they're following the uh, the trend lines of consumer almost like a two year lag time. What was hot in consumer and social space. And, and, and this is true for not just EMC, but all the other, you know, players in that field. Uh, so it's it's always interesting to see, uh, like VMware this year. VMware's big uh, keynote presentation at VMworld was talking about connected devices and uh, the uh, making sure the experience was 
uh, consistent uh, from, a, from an IT provisioning perspective as well as a, a workflow perspective from the, the mobile device of choice to the desktop, uh, wherever it may be located, whether, you know, if they're a telecommuter or if they're you know, in the office or if they're in multiple offices. And so, uh, you know, everybody's considering these things that we've been talking about for <laughs> several years in our space, right, in the consumer space. Well, and it, it's certainly the case that, uh, as we talked right before the call, it's like the implications of all of this is an explosion in the amount of data that has to be uh, processed in some way. It really is the, the, the age of big data finally is arriving. Um, and the explosion in number of uh, connected devices is just going to uh, ratchet that up by orders of magnitude. So uh, you've you've been uh, in in kind of the startup space as well as uh, when you were acquired by Comcast, you kind of had a taste of what a large enterprise functions like. So you and it was a kind of at this pivotal time when you know smartphones were were taking root. Uh, so what was the attitude uh, going in, and you know now that you're you're uh, moving on to your next venture, what is the, what was the attitude shift like towards like the bring your own device trend there? Yeah, well I would say uh, at this point I, I will not speak for Comcast. Since of course. I, I've left the mothership. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, the, the notion that devices like this are not just a nice convenience but are a radical agent of transformation, mm -hmm. I think that's actually pretty well understood now. Um, that, uh, you know, particularly in the TV landscape, um, everything is becoming a screen and people want to be able to watch what they want at any time on any screen. One of the things uh, that I started to get excited about recently and make a little mention of it in the blog post is these devices, they're, you know, they're a personal computer in your pocket, way cool. Mm -hmm. uh, liberating in and of itself, but um, what I'm so excited about is how many different kinds of functions are now embedded in this one device, essentially because of the sensor payload. So it's becoming an all-in-one device that's replacing a bunch of otherwise single-purpose things like your point-and-shoot camera or your, your camcorder, your Walkman. Um, it's increasingly going to become your wallet and with an extension, maybe a cash register if you're a merchant. And the next wave that I'm most interested in is, is this actually as a form of identity? Yeah. Because you basically should be able to, with your permission, have this thing light up a, a personalized experience for you wherever you are, whether that's in your living room looking at the 55 inch screen or out shopping. The world should, uh, when you want them to know who you are, be able to do that electronically, seamlessly, without you having to log into something. So, and this this trans this would transition perfectly, I think, into your your bit about the personal cloud, which is also, by the way, something I'm I'm kind of passionate about personally. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about like connected devices and what that means, yeah. because it's more than just the 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 the. The hub, which is, I guess, the mobile mobile phone or the tablet for most people. What what are you talking about when you when you speak about like the connected devices? There's a whole like network of stuff that goes. Together. Yeah. So the, I think the biggest irony for me as I started exploring the space is, on the one hand, this thing is taking on the functions of dozens and dozens of different devices. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's not doing away with the emergence of other devices. In fact, we're entering a new golden age, in which uh, compute devices uh, come start to come in all shapes and sizes because Moore's law allows us to make a, not only a computer in your pocket but now a computer a specialized computer that soon will be able to fit into a button on my shirt uh, one example of that is uh, this is the Zio sleep monitor uh, which uh, essentially takes the functionality of uh, a sleep research center, which you in the past would have to go in and get some clunky big device hooked up to you, uh, but you can wear this comfortably and connect it with your smartphone and essentially get a recording of your um, sleep uh, 
whether, uh, you know, kind of minute by minute, uh, light, deep, REM, mm -hmm. or ache. It's just one example of a connected device. This one that I can wear, there's also the um, Fitbit and the Jawbone Up. Right. All things that I'm start basically wearable computing becomes feasible now. Yeah. As well as taking the same kind of small uh, computer that talks to the network and embedding that in your uh, refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Or I think the sexiest device, uh, connected device in this space is from uh, a new startup called Nest, where they've essentially taken on the sleepy home thermostat industry and mm -hmm. apply Apple kind of design sensibility. In fact, the guys behind it are folks who are involved in the design of uh, the iPhone and iPod. Okay. And so it's, uh, you know, all, instead of being a dumb device, it's hard to use. It's, it's as sleek and smart as an iPhone and you can interact with it over the network. Hmm. There's, a, there's actually so a bunch of stuff. starting to see it. There's a bunch of stuff that's really kind of cool in that space. Uh, there's two devices that I've got my eye on. Uh, yeah. One uh, is is a app or is a, is a little device from uh, I saw on Kickstarter glasses that via Bluetooth. I mean, you can put prescription lenses in them, which is good for like, people like you and I. Uh, that you can uh, turn it. It's it's a uh, camera uh, that's made by the the makers of Flip. Yeah. And it uh, communicates via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi with uh, your phone or your computer. So, nice. yeah, totally hidden. And it actually looks like a real, not nothing like big and bulky. It actually looks like regular glasses. And uh, the other one, which I saw rumors of in the New York Times this week, you probably saw it as well, is the Google glasses or the Google goggles that they say also yeah. look like legitimate glasses that uh, give you the heads-up display, which really, I think, heralds a new era, <laughs> possible uh, new era, you know, where, where everything social is connected, you know, 24-7 to not augmented reality or augmented thinking, really. Yeah, and, and, you know, a lot of this stuff we've been talking about or reading in, uh, about in science fiction mm -hmm. for a long time, what's changed now is finally Moore's Law has brought us to the point where it becomes economical to uh, feasible to build at a small size and economical to manufacture these truly embedded computers. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting little data point, which is, you know, a few years ago, uh, typical ISP uh, would see in any given home typically one or two or maybe three uh, IP nodes uh, because of basically a couple of desktop computers. Right. Already that's now somewhere around six or seven. And wow. it's about to explode um, because of these various devices. And that's part of the reason why we've had to move uh, to IPv6. Because mm -hmm. we're running out of namespace. And so it really is this, uh, I've never seen anything like this. You know, cloud, all about computing in these data centers you don't see anywhere and you have no idea what the computer is, but the computers are all connected to the network. And mobile, putting all the power in my hands, and then compute that's connected to the network disappearing into the fabric of our home and fabric of our shirts and jackets coming up. So, uh, right. fascinating time. So, the, uh, that, and that's kind of uh, a good definition of the uh, pervasive personal cloud that you mentioned in your post. Uh, the, now, uh, I, I mentioned this in the email when we were talking last week or this week, uh, but uh, I, I've been talking about the the per, I've been using the term personal cloud for a couple of years. But when I first envisioned it, or or was thinking about it, it was in terms of uh, the living room experience, uh, and very much centered around uh, entertainment and uh, where you store it and all that mess. And at the time, I think it was spurred by you know, of course, I'm sure you read Mark Cuban's famous blog posts and uh, he had talked about the his vision for the future of entertainment which was that everything is stored on the cloud and uh, you just download it on demand and license it whenever you need it which I, everybody in the blogosphere thought was a ridiculous idea of course now we have Netflix and Hulu and all these other things that maybe <laughs> maybe it wasn't so crazy but uh, <clears throat> my idea was that you know it was kind of the uh, the Microsoft paradigm I, I did accurately predict that the Xbox 
and devices like it would be the center of uh, video consumption in the living room when it came to uh, alternative type media and some regular media. But I was thinking more that uh, people would be building their own, you know, per I mean, because my thought was that, okay, you've got this stack of DVDs and this stack of CDs, maybe not so much CDs, but DVDs for certain, yeah. that you can basically condense down to, you know, one or two hard drives. Why wouldn't you have a personal media server in your house for that? And that has failed to happen. But the, uh, the personal cloud certainly has come to fruition in, in both your, your description and in mine uh, when it comes to services like you know, the BoxyBox or the Roku or the Xbox or even the PlayStation and the Wii, where not only is this, this console or, or uh, uh, you know, video playback device that uh, wasn't even, didn't even exist a, a few years ago is now <clears throat> the center of interactive and non-interactive entertainment in the living room. Yep, and, and I think the, uh, so there, in my view there's kind of at least two dimensions to this cloudification. One is that, you know, is the stuff that I want to get access to available to me from the cloud? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like cloud 1.0. This, the stuff that got me excited in writing this blog post is the uh, implications of taking that and then mashing it up with these other trends. The ability to know I'm me, so personalize that experience that you deliver. And with social layered in there, essentially, now I, I should, I should, any service should know who you are, where you are, what you like, who your friends are, what your friends like, and on and on and on, and be able to essentially create for you a radically better, more personalized service. And where it gets interesting to me is it's essentially a new equation around privacy. It's, it's a little creepy to think about uh, any one service provider holding not only my data and content, but also this ever-growing mountain of usage data and social data, but my prediction is we will increasingly be happy to hand over that data in exchange for uh, more personalized service, greater control, or both. Um, and so I talk about different, different sectors of personalized clouds where that balance of power might be, might be different in one than in another. Well, I mean, this brings up one of the eternal social web TV conversations you guys used to have, which yeah. is open versus silo, right? So yeah. I am interested in your prediction of, of where that lays, maybe not next year, because I think that's probably too short of a timeline to say the science will get settled, but maybe in the next five years. Is, is something like APML or activity streams going to take root and mm -hmm. allow that attention data to transcend any single network? It's a really interesting question, and I, I think in the blog post, I, I don't get down to quite that level of, of the detail, but where, where I'm interested in is kind of uh, just the nature of things. Uh, to deliver a great service in 2012 and 2013 will increasingly mean that the service provider gets that it's a world of cloud and mobile and connected devices and social, and is trying really hard to give you not a dumb service, but a completely personalized, adaptive, ever smarter service. Right. If service providers are going to do that, the equation will have to be between user and, and service provider that there's this assumption that it's okay for all of that data to go to the service provider. Right. Now, will that data ever be something that the user could actually take from that provider and bring to another one, doesn't matter what the technology is, the answer is essentially no. The service providers, first of all, they're gonna, it's gonna be such a mountain of data, and they're clearly going down the cloud path, not just to give you better service, but to lock you in. That is the strategy in cloud, is to create an ever more personalized experience that makes it harder and harder for you to move from Apple's cloud to Google's cloud mm -hmm. to Amazon's cloud.
that's the game. I get it. And what I found in thinking it through that was interesting, I hadn't discovered, is the kind of counterbalance to that is being played in part by Facebook. And there might be others who play in the space, but right now the action that I think is interesting is watching what's happening as Spotify and Hulu and Netflix and a few others make what could be a devil's bargain in that they're connecting their services up to Facebook in such a way that taps all of these trends and enables viral spread through social discovery and faster growth of these services in exchange for letting all of that really valuable, potentially proprietary data that is the source of cloud lock-in yeah. to flow through Facebook and into their data vault and emerging AI engine. Right. Which ultimately could be the disintermediator. It could be the, the methodology for enabling the user to move from one cloud lock-in vendor to another. So it's really kind of ironic. Well, you know, and as you, as you mentioned that, and this, this goes back to something we both said at the beginning of the, uh, the, the talk here, is that well, there's big data, right? Well, what's the big driving technology behind big data today is, is technologies like Hadoop and NoSQL that allow uh, it's kind of a, a different approach to deciphering uh, data that's not structured. And kind of it, it makes me think about like all the conversations we've all had regarding these different like open open data structures like APML and, and activity streams where we're trying to define a format for data so that everybody can use the data you know across different networks it may not it may turn out that it doesn't matter right these devil's bargains means that they every every you know or maybe not every but different silos will have different chunks of the attention data and because it's becoming such a mess everyone's got their own proprietary data format that right. they're using internally, everyone just relies on unstructured data sorting techniques uh, to kind of level the playing field. Right? Well, we, we don't have access to the data structure, but we can scrape and we we can scrape and analyze and figure it out. You know, using Hadoop or Flumes or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So I think there's at least one or two more blog posts to come to think <laughs> how all these things are going to play out. But uh, I, I've now actually just gotten really excited about things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's great, and, and given where your head's at, it's going to be interesting to see where where you land next, or what uh, what world problem you're going to try to solve with uh, <laughs> the next startup. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, I think so much of this, uh, you, know, you know, what I like to do when I'm in between startups is take a look at how the world is now. Mm -hmm. Where are the waves? Where are things heading? Because uh, it's a heck of a lot more fun to jump onto an emerging big wave than it is to uh, kind of slosh around in the trough. Right. Um, one of the other things I want to touch on, which I, I also, the, the, the post was a bit of a, a voyage of discovery, which is in that world, in entertainment in particular, we saw this, you know, the cloud vendors going for lock-in versus um, Facebook as a potential disintermediator. The other one that I, really is exciting to me is um, looking at um, digital health and the uh, the emerging various sub clouds, personal health clouds that are there, which are not being provided to us by the people who uh, fix us when we're broken. The health industry is not doing this, but their their the individuals are now able to begin to change the balance of power between patient and medical. Uh, institution and industry as a result of a bunch of different things that are enabling us now to get our hands on a lot more data about our own health and fitness mm -hmm. uh, and I you know I mentioned the the sleep monitoring but that's like one of uh, a dozen or more things that right. you've also got like 23 in me and all the DNA monitoring services that kind of fit into that equation as well that's right so uh, 23 and me I think of as you know uh, personal geno genomic cloud. Uh, I did some work recently with a, a company called Your Future Health, uh, where I had my blood drawn and tested against 70 different variables. And this company has been doing this for like 30 years. Wow. Funny little uh, fact, uh, when you go in with a symptom, 
to your doctor and complain about a problem, they may order blood work to try and figure out what's wrong. That will be tested against some standard test and say, hey, is, are you within two standard deviations of the mean? Well, that mean has been slowly moving over the last 30 years as America has gotten less fit. Hmm. So being within two standard deviations of the mean is ever less meaningful information. Hmm. These folks have uh, what may be the world's largest database of uh, blood data across 70 factors correlated with gender, age, weight, height, and blood type. So they know uh, that for a person like me, my magnesium level is alarmingly low, even though it fits within what the doctor would say is normal. Okay. And so there's this change in the balance of power between patient and uh, health industry. Interesting. Very interesting. So, yeah, I mean, these are, I mean, I've, I've, that's one kind of blind spot for me is I haven't kept up with the personal health space, but I know it's like constantly evolving around me. I mean, just, just by the, because I'm like 23 and me user, so I see all the kind of stuff on the, the forums yeah. and the boards and whatnot, but I don't have, don't have the time to investigate, but it's very interesting stuff, and it, it's, it's always so, uh, at least with with the service, my, my service, twenty three years, so striking to me how well they utilize a lot of the principles of social, like crowdsourcing and whatnot yep. to arrive at the data in ways that uh, I think med medicine and science hasn't in the past. Yes. I mean because it's, it's voluntary uh, surrendering of uh, you know data points, and then they're just taking their technical experience, and social experience, and applying applying those principles to it. Very cool. Well, and it's just, it's a great area for, uh, you, for use of the cloud. Mm -hmm. So the more people that use the Zio sleep uh, monitoring system, the larger the data set that Zio has to look at what normal is. And right. you know, having my data c compared with anonymized data, again, correlated with other factors like age, begins to let us understand stuff that previously was not possible. So it's actually kind of the cutting edge of science mm -hmm. yeah it's it you know going back to you know this this is this is perfect perfect way to explain the uh, outside of the narrow entertainment scope uh, the, the the connected devices and personal cloud uh, health is a, is a great way of doing it because it's not only interesting and, and fun to toy with but it also has very valid and uh, you know advancing of humanity type applications so yeah and uh, you know, I saw that when uh, Zuck recently got um, the jawbone up, yes. you know, it was, can't wait to be able to send all of this data through Facebook. So mm -hmm. again, back to like, you know, who are the, who will be the, the keepers of the cloud and who will be the hubs that will essentially have a replicated uh, version of that data set to essentially do some kind of value add on top of which which actually this this is a, a, a theme that we explored a little bit in 2011 which is uh, how increasingly the term privacy and security are becoming interchangeable uh, because I mean, I, the, the just going off of like the last few headlines uh, with Facebook uh, Mark Zuckerberg had a small uh, problem with Facebook and uh, in terms of privacy settings and his personal pictures were released out to the public you know that's fine and dandy when it's pictures of him you know posing with the head of a bison or playing around in the backyard but you know when it's your health data you know right. some, some people care and some people don't some people are like Jeff Jarvis that well oh yeah I'll just you know throw out there all my ontology uh, oncology reports but and some people are like I don't want you know my, my spouse seeing that let alone everybody on Facebook Oh yeah, when you get into the health data, it's a, you know, it's a, the, the privacy equation changes quite a bit. It can have real implications for whether you can get insurance or not. Uh, yeah, let alone the, the financial implications of it, correct? Yeah. So, interesting times ahead, huh? Absolutely. All right. I think it's an interesting time, whether you're a consumer or someone creating a service for consumers or a company creating uh, better technologies for handling this tsunami of data that will need to be intelligently stored 
and access to the process. Well, I mean, so, I mean, this is kind of uh, an interesting question because the, the type of stuff that we're talking about here is at some point, I mean, it looks almost as if the consumer and enterprise markets are collapsing into each other because a lot of the applications we're talking about, uh, a lot of the, the, the use cases we're talking about are, are kind of transcend either, either direction. Right. I mean, we're talking yeah. about organization of big data, sensor, sensor points. I mean, that was one of the things that led, uh, led us into, uh, into the storage market initially and then the, the broader enterprise market was we were talking with some folks over at SAP and what they were calling, um, I can't remember the term they were using for it. I think they were just using a kind of a generic enterprise-y sounding set of words. Uh, but it was basically the stuff that we've been talking about calling the Internet of Things. The example that they were giving was that uh, I think it was Boston Harbor or something like that uh, was able to improve efficiency and, and you know greenify their operation by putting uh, uh, sensors, uh, putting little little uh, RFID tags on all the crates, so that at any point at any time they could tell you where everything was. And they weren't relying on word of mouth or some some. Uh, Teamster having written it down on a clipboard and getting getting entered into the system, so they were able to improve their efficiency vastly. I and mean, this is the type of stuff that we've been talking about when we speak of the Internet of Things and all the, the sensors that we have on our different devices. I mean, it's the same volume of data being generated and the same problems being tackled by you know Google and Facebook and Yahoo when they're you know trying to organize a mountain of data. Isn't that the same problem that enterprise is faced with today? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I'm not as much an enterprise guy, but I'd say that certainly, it, it, perhaps absent to some degree the social piece, um, enterprise is going to be as big a bigger player around tapping this new compute layer of cloud combined with radically distributed tiny little sensor devices uh, combined with a workforce that will be carrying around mobile compute. So, yeah, you know, that Internet of Things will, will transform uh, supply chain uh, and any kind of large-scale global operation you know, is radically different uh, and better when you can have every piece of it um, and connect it with a, a, a little wireless sensor. Right. Well, I mean, that and, you know, the the thing that changed in our space, I can tell you from, from our editorial, in the last two years is because the price of storage has gone down so dramatically that uh, enterprise no longer discards data like they used to. And so uh, that also has contributed to the need, I think, for this stuff. Um, but it, and, and that, I think, it may be even more analogous to, like, the search uh, quandary or the search uh, algorithm problem that Google and others try to solve, which is, you know, being able to have every data point possible accessible at a keystroke from all points on the planet, you know, right. which uh, <clears throat> is, is something that I think is more broadly familiar than uh, maybe the, the stuff that we try to tackle with social and, and cloud, but uh, it is definitely... I think, in my opinion, I think it is. I think it's turning into kind of a flattening, flattening of uh, consumer and enterprise into one another, or perhaps maybe the consumerization of IT, as some put it. Um, it's 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 seem, seeming to look a lot more like each other, in my in my yeah. view. Well, one one of my favorite startups uh, recent times is uh, uh, called HipChat. Uh, guys that used to be at Plaxo, mm -hmm. and they're one of these rare cases of. Uh, you know, a three-person startup offering uh, you know cloud-based collaboration software that does not suck. Yeah. And, uh, that can be adapt, you know, adopted in the enterprise by a small team, and then can spread to uh, the whole organization and can spread to partner organizations. Anyway, they're seeing viral distribution, viral spread of a an IT solution that you have to pay for. Wow. And you know. I've been involved in enterprise sales and marketing, and the, you know, viral was not the term I would use for you know the U.S. government procurement process or trying <laughs> to land Boeing or General Motors as a customer. And and now the you know, so it's beautiful to see that enterprise IT market starting to have a lot more of the flavor of better 
consumer-like tools that people in the enterprise can adopt uh, without uh, some guy in a back room having to go through an eight-month approval cycle. Right. Well, it's all very interesting stuff, John. I thank you for taking the time to sit and discuss it with me. Is there anything else, uh, anything else that you have pressing that uh, you wanna you wanna mention to everybody before we uh, we we let them experience 2012 for themselves? Uh, no, but uh, you know, go check out uh, therealmccray.com because uh, now that I'm uh, I'm no longer inside a big corporation, I feel it's time to blog more. Yeah, it's always it's always fun to have uh, have. Have, a, have some time to express yourself. When you're down in the trenches, it's hard to blog a lot. So, uh, therealmccray.com, and uh, of course, you'll be able to find this on siliconangle.com and siliconangle TV. And uh, happy holidays, everyone, and we'll see you in 2012. Have a great new year.